Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. Today's topic of discussion is hydraulically and electrically sequenced cylinders. Our objective is to examine hydraulically and electrically sequenced actuators. We'll compare and contrast multi-actuator systems sequenced solely with hydraulic sequence valves, multi-actuator systems sequenced solely with electrical switches, and hybrids of both types. We'll discuss the limitations of simple systems and the advantages offered by increasingly robust systems that not only check pressure, but also confirm position. Consider this most primitive of multi-actuator systems making use of two separate manually operated directional control valves to independently operate two cylinders. If this system's intention was to clamp a workpiece using cylinder one and then bend or press it using cylinder two, an operator would have to be trained on its proper use and dutifully execute the same sequence over and over without fail. First, directional control valve one must be placed into the straight through position and the clamp cylinder must securely clamp the workpiece. Then directional control valve one must be returned to the closed center to maintain the hold. Then directional control valve two must be placed into the straight through position and the bend cylinder must completely bend the workpiece. Then directional control valve two must be placed into the cross connect position to fully retract the bend cylinder. Finally, directional control valve one must be placed into the cross connect position to fully retract the clamp cylinder. An operator must then return directional control valve one to the closed center position, eject the bent workpiece and place another unbent one to return this system to the beginning of this cyclical operation. Note the bend portion of the sequence must occur fast enough so leakage through closed center spool of directional control valve one does not reduce the clamping force and the entire sequence must reliably occur in the exact same order over and over. For example, if directional control valve was ever mistakenly left in the straight through position while directional control valve two was moved into the straight through position, the parallel nature of this circuit would see pressure in the clamp cylinder fall while the bent cylinder extended and potentially dislodged the workpiece. I know you're a smart person, there's only a couple sequential actions, but if this routine seems too complicated for the dunderpates you work with to grasp, you're right. Long story short, Never trust commoners to run anything more complicated than a system that has a single large green button that says go. For this reason, consider this modified circuit making use of a single directional control valve that stops, starts, and changes direction of flow for a parallel circuit of two hydraulic cylinders. Although there is now a single manual actuation point, actuation sequence would be entirely dependent upon pressure requirements of a given cylinder and flow would be routed to the one with the lowest pressure requirement first. If the bend cylinder actuated first, without the workpiece being properly clamped, it might potentially dislodge the workpiece and ruin it. For this reason, consider the steadily upgraded multi-actuator system making use of a sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder. Recall during the sequence valve lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we discussed a pressure control valve known as a sequence valve used to coordinate the actuation sequence of a multi-actuator system. Sequence valves are normally closed valves that open when pressure sensed on their pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value. The sequence valve also includes a check valve bypass, which circumvents the valve, allowing a reverse operation with no pressure restriction. In this upgraded circuit, when an operator actuates the directional control valve into the straight through position, the normally closed sequence valve initially prevents the extension of the bend cylinder and only the clamp cylinder extends. When the clamp cylinder makes contact with the workpiece, pressure rises to that of the set value of the sequence valve. Let's say the set valve is 500 PSI, equivalent to the pressure necessary for the clamp cylinder to generate force sufficient to properly clamp the workpiece. When pressure reaches 500 PSI, the sequence valve maintains pressure in the primary circuit at 500 PSI and opens, allowing the bend cylinder to extend. When the bend cylinder makes contact with a properly clamped workpiece, pressure on the outlet side of the sequence valve rises to the set point, at which time the sequence valve is now considered fully open and pressure continues to rise. When the bend cylinder bottoms out at the limits of travel, or travel is otherwise restricted, pressure rises to that of the main pressure relief valve. Let's say the main pressure relief valve has a set value of 1000 PSI. Pressure in both actuators rises to 1000 PSI and the bend cylinder bends the object. Note how the pressure decision made by the sequence valve coordinates the actuation sequence of this multi-actuator system using a single directional control valve. 
When the directional control valve is shifted back to the cross-connect position, note the check valve bypass circumvents the sequence valve and allows the bend cylinder to retract with no pressure precondition. Note as currently implemented, during retraction, both cylinders would be placed in parallel with one another and sequence of retraction would be pressure dependent. The cylinder with the least pressure requirement would retract first. While suitable for some applications, this might not be the most desirable of scenarios if we wanted to ensure the clamp cylinder maintained the workpiece secure while the bend cylinder retracted, then retracted the clamp cylinder as a final step. For this reason, consider yet another sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder that allows this additional functionality. When the directional control valve is shifted to the straight through position, this upgraded circuit first extends the clamp cylinder, then extends the bend cylinder ensuring the bend cylinder only bends a properly clamped workpiece as previously. Then, when the directional control valve is shifted to the cross-connect position, the circuit will first retract the bend cylinder, then retract the clamp cylinder. Allow me to demonstrate. When an operator actuates the directional control valve into the straight-through position, the normally closed sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder initially prevents the extension of the bend cylinder, and only the clamp cylinder extends. Note the check valve bypass on the sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder circumvents the valve and the clamp cylinder extends with no pressure precondition. When the clamp cylinder makes contact with the workpiece, pressure rises to the set value of the sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder. At this point, the sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder maintains pressure in the primary circuit and opens, allowing the bend cylinder to extend. When the bend cylinder makes contact with a properly clamped workpiece, the sequence valve fully opens and pressure continues to rise. When the bend cylinder bottoms out at the limits of travel or is otherwise restricted, pressure rises to that of the main pressure relief valve. Note how the pressure decision made by the sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder coordinates the actuation sequence as provided by the straight through position of the directional control valve, and the sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder is bypassed. Long story short, clamp first, then bend. When the directional control valve is returned to the cross-connect position, note the check valve bypass routes flow around the sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder and allows the bend cylinder to retract with no pressure precondition. However, the normally closed sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder initially prevents retraction of the clamp cylinder. Only when the bend cylinder fully retracts does pressure rise to that of the set value of the sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder. At this point, the sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder maintains pressure in the primary circuit and opens, allowing the clamp cylinder to retract. Note how the pressure decision made by the sequence valve on the rod end of the clamp cylinder coordinates the actuation sequence as provided by the cross-connect position of the directional control valve and the sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder is bypassed. Long story short, retract the bend cylinder first, then retract the clamp cylinder. Note as currently implemented, these systems making use of hydraulic sequence valves only make an actuation decision based on pressure only. The system never actually checks if the clamp or bend cylinder have fully extended or retracted or not. This could be problematic if the clamp or bend cylinder ever reached the limits of travel early due to an obstruction, jam, or had a blocked port. In these sequences, pressure would still rise to that of the sequence valve set value and the bend or clamp cylinder might actuate prematurely. For this reason, consider this slightly more robust, electrically controlled clamp and bend circuit, making use of not only a sequence valve, but also limit switches that confirm the physical travel of the bend cylinder. Not only does this system offer similar functionality, the sequence can be initiated at the touch of a button, freeing an operator from the necessity of having to manually shift and then hold a valve in position while the system conducts the desired sequence. The primary hydraulic circuit is paired with a pilot ladder logic diagram that governs its operation. The primary hydraulic circuit is almost the same as our previous hydraulic circuit, making use of a single sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder. Only this time, it includes two limit switches, LS1 and LS2, respectively at the limits of extension and the limits of retraction. Note in the de-energized start state, the bend cylinder is assumed to be fully retracted and is triggering limit switch 2. 
We should therefore expect limit switch 2 in the ladder logic diagram to be held in its activated opposite state. The first rung of the pilot ladder logic diagram includes a maintained contact normally closed e-stop, a momentary contact normally closed stop push button, a momentary contact normally open start push button, and normally closed limit switch 1, the limit switch at the limits of extension of the bend cylinder in series with the coil of a control relay, CR1. The second rung includes a holding, latching, memory, or sealing contact, CR1A, associated with control relay CR1. Given the normally open start push button intending to initiate operation is momentary in nature, the holding contact established by CR1A frees an operator from the necessity of holding the start push button down. Rung 3 includes a normally open contact, CR1B, associated with control relay CR1 in series with the A solenoid of directional control valve 1. Rung 4 includes a normally closed contact, CR1C, associated with control relay CR1, and the normally closed limit switch 2 being held open in series with the B solenoid of directional control valve 1. Again, note in the de-energized start state, the bend cylinder is assumed to be fully retracted and is triggering the normally closed limit switch 2 into the open state. Limit switch 2 is normally closed by nature, however it is being held open by the fully retracted bend cylinder. Note how the electrical interlock provided by the normally open contact CR1B and the normally closed contact CR1C prevents simultaneous assertion of both solenoid A and solenoid B. Not only does the act of simultaneously retracting and extending a cylinder not make sense, it is a situation that may damage one or both of the solenoids. One may assume that the spool of directional control valve 1 would maintain centered when both solenoid A and solenoid B are simultaneously energized because it would be tugged in equal and opposite directions. However, this is not the case because one solenoid always gets the drop on the other. The solenoid losing the tug of war continues to experience inrush current and dies in early death. For this reason, CR1B and CR1C are opposite aspects of the same relay controlling the state of both solenoids. When solenoid A is energized, solenoid B is de-energized. In contrast, when solenoid B is energized, solenoid A would be de-energized. Let's examine how this hybrid system works to coordinate the actuation sequence of this multi-actuator system. When an operator presses the start push button via the normally closed e-stop, the normally closed stop, the now closed start button, and the normally closed limit switch 1, a complete path of current is established in the first rung and the coil of control relay CR1 energizes. When the coil of control relay CR1 energizes, the associated contacts change states. CR1A closes. CR1B closes and CR1C opens. The closed CR1A contact in rung 2 establishes a holding circuit and operator can now release the start button. The closed CR1B contact energizes solenoid A. On the hydraulic side, the energized A solenoid shifts the directional control valve into the straight through position. Pressurized flow fills the cap end of the clamp cylinder and the clamp cylinder extends. The normally closed sequence valve on the cap end of the bend cylinder initially prevents movement of the bend cylinder. When the clamp cylinder makes contact with the workpiece, pressure rises to the set value of the sequence valve, at which point the sequence valve maintains pressure in the primary line and opens. The bend cylinder extends. Note when the bend cylinder leaves the reset region of limit switch 2 at the limits of retraction. The LS2 contact in rung 4 is no longer being held open and returns to its deactivated, normally closed state. The bend cylinder bends the object until some portion of the bent object or the bend cylinder makes contact with LS1 at the limits of extension. The LS1 contact in rung 1 opens. The open LS1 contact de-energizes the coil of control relay CR1. When the coil of control relay CR1 de-energizes, the associated contacts return to their deactivated states. CR1A opens and removes the holding circuit. CR1B opens and de-energizes solenoid A. The de-energized solenoid A shifts the directional control valve to the spring-centered position. CR1C returns to the normally closed state. Given limit switch 2 is closed due to the bend cylinder not triggering it at the limits of retraction, solenoid B is energized. 
on the hydraulic side, the energized B solenoid shifts directional control valve 1 into the cross-connect position. Pressurized flow fills the rod end of both the clamp and band cylinders in a parallel relationship where sequence of retraction is pressure dependent. Note although I've illustrated the actions controlled by the CR1A, CR1B, and CR1C contacts sequentially, in reality, these actions occur quasi-simultaneously. Note when the bend cylinder leaves the reset region of limit switch 1 at the limits of extension, the LS1 contact in rung 1 would no longer be held into the open position and would return to the deactivated normally closed state. Also note during the act of retraction, flow is routed around the sequence valve in the cap end of the bend cylinder through the check valve bypass, allowing it to retract with no pressure precondition. Finally, when the bend cylinder fully retracts, it would strike limit switch 2 at the limits of retraction. The LS2 contact in rung 4 would open. The open LS2 contact would de-energize solenoid B. Directional control valve 1 shifts to the spring center position. We've returned to the start state of our clamp and bend cylinder. Note this hybrid clamp and bend system is really just a modified version of the manually actuated one using a single sequence valve. Really the only advantage this hybrid system offers is the fact that the sequence is initiated at the touch of a button and then automatically completed by the incorporation of the two limit switches in the ladder logic diagram. The system doesn't really coordinate the retraction of the clamp and bend cylinders, but rather places them in parallel with one another. This could be problematic if the clamp cylinder ever lagged significantly behind the bend cylinder and the bend cylinder triggered the limit switch too prior to the clamp cylinder being fully retracted. For this reason, consider this substantially upgraded electrically sequenced clamp and bend system. This is not a circuit suitable for some clueless leg on the first day of ground week, but by no means is it unfathomable if you take your time and examine it piece by piece. This being said, you will bust an o-ring if you're not sufficiently warmed up when you take this one on. By all means, feel free to pause the lecture and do some jumping jacks and light stretching before we continue. Note the absence of a sequence valve in the primary hydraulic system and the presence of an additional directional control valve. As we'll demonstrate, the responsibility of sequencing this multi-actuator system now belongs solely to the ladder logic diagram using not only a pressure switch, but also limit switches in both the clamp and bend cylinders. Note the de-energized start state of this system assumes both the clamp and bend cylinders are fully retracted. We should therefore expect both limit switch 2, the limit switch at the limits of the clamp cylinder retraction, and limit switch 4, the limit switch at the limits of the bend cylinder retraction to be held in their activated opposite state. The primary hydraulic circuit includes the solenoid actuated 3 position directional control valve, DCV1, that directly controls the double acting clamp cylinder. Additionally, it includes the solenoid actuated 2 position directional control valve, DCV2 that directly controls the double acting bend cylinder. Additionally note the presence of a pressure switch, PS1, on the cap end of the clamp cylinder. When pressure on the input port of the pressure switch rises to the adjustable set value, these associated electrical contacts would change to their activated opposite states. When pressure falls to the slightly smaller reset value, the associated electrical contacts would return to their deactivated state. The differential between set and reset pressure values is desirable in that it prevents switch chatter when pressure hovers near the set value or experiences minor pressure drops. Before taking a tour of the ladder logic diagram, note it incorporates two control relays, CR1 in red and CR2 in blue. Note all the contacts associated with a particular control relay have been assigned the same color. This is not a common practice but in my personal opinion, this technique makes this ladder logic diagram ever so slightly more readable. The first rung of the ladder logic diagram includes the normally open side of limit switch 2 being held closed by the fully retracted clamp cylinder. Note this switch is mechanically interlocked with a normally closed side being held open in rung 3. Rung 1 additionally includes a momentary contact normally open push button in series with a coil of control relay CR1. The second rung of the ladder logic diagram includes the normally closed limit switch 3 contact triggered by the fully extended bend cylinder. On normally open contact CR1A associated with control relay CR1 in rung 1, a normally open pressure switch contact PS1, the normally closed limit switch 1 contact triggered by the fully extended clamp cylinder, 
and the A solenoid of DCV2, the DCV in charge of the bend cylinder. The third rung of the ladder logic diagram includes the normally closed side of LS2 being held open by the fully retracted clamp cylinder. Note this switch is mechanically interlocked with a normally open side being held closed in rung 1 above. Rung 3 additionally includes a normally closed contact, CR2A, associated with control relay CR2 in rung 4 below, and the B solenoid of directional control valve 1, the directional control valve in charge of retracting the clamp cylinder. The fourth rung of the ladder logic diagram includes a normally open contact, CR1B, associated with control relay CR1 in rung 1 above, and the coil of control relay CR2. Finally, the fifth rung of the ladder logic diagram includes the normally closed limit switch 4 contact being held open by the fully retracted bend cylinder and the A solenoid of DCV1, the directional control valve in charge of extending the clamp cylinder. Let's examine how this electrical controlled system works to coordinate the actuation sequence of this multi-actuator system. When an operator presses the start push button, a path of current is established and the coil of control relay CR1 is energized. When the coil of control relay CR1 is energized, its associated contacts change states. CR1A closes, establishing a holding circuit, which allows an operator to release the start push button. CR1B closes, which energizes both the coil of control relay CR2 and the A solenoid of DCB1. When the coil of control relay CR2 is energized, its associated contacts change states. CR2A opens. On the hydraulic side, the energized A solenoid shifts DCV1 to the straight through position. Pressurized flow fills the cap end of the clamp cylinder. When it departs the reset region of LS2, LS2 is no longer being held in its activated opposite states. The LS2 contact rung 1 opens and the mechanically interlocked LS2 contact in rung 3 closes. The clamp cylinder continues to extend until it strikes LS1 at the limits of travel. Given the travel of the clamp cylinder is now restricted, pressure in the cap end of the clamp cylinder rises to the set value of the pressure switch PS1, at which point the PS1 contact in rung 2 closes. When both PS1 and LS1 are closed, this establishes yet another path of current and DCV2 sole A is energized. The energized A solenoid of DCV2 shifts DCV2 to the straight through position and the bend cylinder extends. Upon leaving the reset region of limit switch 4, limit switch 4 is no longer being held in its activated opposite state and the normally closed contact recloses. When the fully extended bend cylinder strikes limit switch 3, the LS3 contact and rung 2 opens which breaks the current path in rung 1 and 2. Several things occur simultaneously. When the coil of control relay CR1 is de-energized, its associated contacts return to their deactivated state. CR1A in rung 2 opens, removing the holding circuit. CR1B in rung 4 opens. However, due to the closed limit switch 4 in rung 5, the coil of control relay 2 is still energized. Additionally, the opening of limit switch 3 de-energizes DCV2 sole A. On the hydraulic side, DCV2 shifts to the cross-connect position and the bend cylinder retracts. Upon leaving the reset region of limit switch 3, limit switch 3 returns to its deactivated closed state. The bend cylinder fully retracts until it hits limit switch 4. Limit switch 4 opens and removes the path of current to rung 4 and 5 several things occur simultaneously. The coil of control relay CR2 is de-energized and its associated contacts return to their deactivated states. CR2A in rung 3 closes. Additionally, DCV1 sole A is de-energized and DCV1 shifts to the closed center position. Given limit switch 2 and CR2A are both closed in rung 3, DCV1 sole B is energized. The energized B solenoid shifts DCV1 into the cross-connect position and the clamp cylinder starts to retract. Several things occur simultaneously. Notably, both PS1 and LS1 return to their deactivated open states when their monitored conditions reach their reset values. 
Finally, when the clamp cylinder fully retracts, its strikes limit switch 2, and the associated contacts change their opposite states. The de-energized B solenoid of DCV1 allows DCV1 to move into the spring-centered closed center position. We have returned to the start state of our electrically sequenced hydraulic system. You may wish to rewind that and watch it again. Note how this purely electrically sequenced clamp and bend system did not require the use of hydraulic sequence valves to coordinate its action, but rather used a pressure switch and limit switches at both the limits of extension and retraction for both the clamp and bend cylinder. This circuit exhibits several desirable traits. First, the complete desired sequence is performed. First, the object is clamped, then the object is bent, then the bend cylinder is retracted, then the clamp cylinder is retracted. Next, the decision is not made exclusively on pressure alone, but rather pressure and position. Note the series relationship of the pressure and the limit switch in rung 2. Both sufficient clamping pressure must exist and the clamp cylinder must be in the correct position for the system to transition to the bend phase. This prevents the bend cylinder from extending early due to a jammed or obstructed clamp cylinder as might happen if this system was constructed solely with hydraulic sequence valves. This just goes to show you that there's more than one way to sequence a multi-actuator system, and this alternative method, using only ladder logic, demonstrates notable advantages. All right, that's about it. In conclusion, we examined several different types of multi-actuator systems and discussed the operational characteristics, advantages, and disadvantages of those coordinated solely by an operator, those coordinated by one or more sequence valves, those being a hybrid of sequence valves and electrical control, and those coordinated solely by electrical control that not only make pressure-based decisions, but also confirm position of both actuators. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.